Amen. Amen. Our God is real. I know he's real because I know and I feel him deep down in my soul. Amen. Amen. I want to thank him for that beautiful selection. I want to say happy Sabbath to you. I want to thank my good friend, Pastor Norwood, for allowing me to share his pulpit and to share the word with you today. He did not give me a topic. He said, Pastor, just let the Lord use you. <laughs> so pray for me as I share with you what God has shared with me. You know, we are living in perilous times. We are in the last days of its history. And Ellen White lets us know that the closing scenes of earth history will be rapid ones. And we see that, haven't we? We see it all around us, so we ought to be encouraged. Amen. And we need to be about the Father's business. We need to do what God has called us to do. Jesus says, what you're going to do, do it quickly. So we don't have much time, so we need to do what God has called us to do. I want to invite you to bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity and privilege you have granted us to come into your presence. Father, I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray, oh God, that my words would be your words, that it will draw each one of us nearer to you. And Lord, while you are saving others, save me in the process. We ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake I do pray. Let everybody say, Amen. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Luke. What did I say? Luke chapter 10. <clears throat> I want to look at Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. I want to ask you to stand in reverence of the word of God. Amen? I'm going to read in your hearing our text for today. I said Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you as lambs among wolves. Notice he says, I'm sending you as lamb among wolves. The clear words say, Vicious wolves. <laughs> yes, sir. He says, carry neither money bag, knapsack, or sandals. He says, and greet no one along the road. You may be seated. Jesus says, greet no one along the road. The clear word says, because your message is urgent. You know, some people just want you to to talk with them, they are lonely. They just want to waste your time. <laughs> Our message is urgent. So we don't have time to lollygag around. Uh, but my, my subject for today is, ye shall be my witnesses. Ye shall be my witnesses. And so the sent one sends them to prepare the way before him. Jesus is the sent one, isn't he? So he sent you, he sent you and me to prepare the way. I heard y'all talking about evangelism. And so before the evangelist preaches, somebody needs to go. <laughs> and so Jesus, the sent one, sent us to go. Amen. Imagine what it is like for Jesus to choose his closing comments. To the disciples as they make their way from Jerusalem to the Blessed Mount of Olives. 
where the disciples had failed Jesus, where his passion began. Perhaps you have had to say goodbye to friends you knew you would never see alive again. I know when I saw my mother in the hospital in, in Miami, Florida, and I was pastoring in Nacogdoches, Texas, I knew I would not see her alive again. And sometimes as I visit people in the hospital, I know I would not see them alive again. I know it would be their last time. So Jesus knew. Jesus knew that these whom he loved and trained would endure tremendous hardship. Jesus knew how that even though they had put their hearts and hands to the plow, they would be tempted to look back because sometimes the road gets difficult. Uh, Jesus says in Luke 9, 62, he says, he says, he says this, he says, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In essence, it says, no one who's put their hand to the plow continually looking back is fit for the kingdom. The clear word puts it this way. He says, no one who wants to follow me but puts other things first is fit to be my disciples. <laughs> so Jesus wants to be number one. He don't want to share you with anybody else. But Jesus said, you know, no one having put their hands to the plow is fit to be a disciple. Lest the great commission become the great omission. For three of the seven recorded conversations or sayings of our risen Lord. And the last or final message from Jesus' lips to the disciples. To be emblazoned as an indelible impression an assurance to them until the moment of their death. Jesus reiterates the mission of the disciples. And go with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. What did I say? Luke chapter 1. You turn with me. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Luke chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. The Bible says this. Luke chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. It says, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in, Ju in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Amen. Amen. And so Ellen White says this in the book Desire of Ages, page 822. She calls it the Gospel Commission. She says, Thus Christ gave his disciples their commission. He made full provision for the prosecution of their work and took upon himself the responsibility for its success. Isn't that good news? Jesus says he's responsible for the success. <laughs> he says so long as they obeyed his word and worked in connection with him, they could not fail. Go to all nations, he bade them. Go to the furthest part of the habitable globe, but know that my presence will be there. That's good news. Then he says, labor in faith and confidence, for the time will never come when I will forsake you. That's good news. Jesus says, I will be there. He says, I will make myself responsible for the success of the work. You just go. Labor in faith and labor with confidence. And so our concern should not be so much as to when the kingdom of Christ is restored as to whether or not we are faithful witnesses of the kingdom. Amen. We are witnesses. Mm -hmm. 
And if there is one thing we need, if there's one thing you need, if there's one thing I need, it is this, the one essential, one which we cannot do without. It is that which fills hearts, the power of the Spirit. Yeah. Amen. That's my first Amen. point. Amen. The power of the Spirit. Jesus makes it clear that the work of God is done by the power of God. Zechariah tells us in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, not by power, huh? Yeah. He says, not by might, yeah. but by my spirit, says Amen. the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Not by human genius mm -hmm. or activity mm -hmm. or by Facebook or talk, whatever you want to call it, or YouTube. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Not by evangelistic programs. Okay. It's by his spirit. You see, it is the Spirit who provides the resources. It is the Spirit that motivates the person. It's the Spirit that blesses the programs. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers the message. I'm the messenger. You see, I can get up here and preach all day, but if the Holy Spirit is not in it, nothing but tingling cymbals and sounding brass. We need God's Spirit if we're going to be so successful and be effective. Witness for him. And the power comes. And the power comes. And when he comes, you cannot have the spirit without the power. Or the power without the spirit. Hear me clearly. You see, to have the spirit and not the power might make you more religious and devout. But would render you loose, useless. To have the power and not the spirit would make you dangerous. Huh? There are those who try to do the work of God without depending on the spirit and power of God. But they either give up or swell up for their own efforts. We are witnesses. The promise is sure. But we must fight. We must first, like the disciples, wait. Wait, get things right and in order. We must be led by the Spirit of God if we are to be sons and daughters of God, to do the work of God. You hear me? Amen. We must obey the Lord and go to the upper room to study the Word, to pray for the promise. And to put aside our differences that we may be one individually and as a church. Now, one thing about the Adventist church, we don't do that. We leave the church. <laughs> and the same problem you bring from this church, you bring it to the other church. <laughs> and so the reason why you have problems because you can't get away from the problem because the problem is you. Now, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, my biggest problem is me. <laughs> but you were saying your biggest problem is the pastor or the elder. No, your biggest problem is you. And you can't get away from you. Because wherever you go, you is with you. <laughs> so, so settle it. My biggest problem is me. That's why Ellen White says the greatest battle ever fought is self. Self is a Self is a bad boy. He's an ugly rascal. Yeah. So we need to understand. We must be willing to obey. Go to the upper room. This is the fuel for heaven's fire that rested upon the disciples. And can come upon you and me. Look what it says in Acts chapter 2 verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Acts chapter 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all, they were all with one accord in one place. Uh -huh. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues, 
as a fire. And one sat upon each of them. Mm -hmm. And then verse 4 says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You can have that and I can have it. But we must do the requirements. The Spirit doesn't come because you want it. But we need to pray and plead for their conditions for the Spirit to come. You see, when the Spirit comes, He does something very special for you and for me. His power transforms you and me into living witnesses. Living witnesses. Jesus says, You are witnesses. Hear me well. You are witnesses. The second point, the people of faith. You shall be witnesses unto me. Here is a prediction. It is not an option. Neither is it mandatory. It is natural. <laughs> it is natural. But we have a choice. But the choice is in accepting or rejecting the call of Christ and the control of the Spirit. You know, we want to rule ourselves. But Jesus is supposed to live supreme. Am I right? You see, it is natural because a branch connected to the vine is fruitful and it multiplies. It not only produces, but also reproduces. By the life of the vine, every seed bearing fruit after its own kind. That's why Jesus says in John 15, 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you will what? Produce much fruit. He says, without me, you can do nothing. And if you're wondering why you're not producing, because we're not connected. Jesus says, you shall be witnesses. He did not say you shall do witness him. It's only natural to be a witness. If you are connected to the vine, hear me clearly. You shall be witnesses, not, he didn't say, you shall do witnessing. Don't worry, let me get a little clear. Because witnessing is not something you do. It is something you are. Right. Right. If you are connected with Jesus, it is something you are. Otherwise, otherwise we make it artificial and perhaps elevate the gifts of evangelism above the other gifts of the Spirit so that unless a person is actively involved in direct soul winning, the everyday life situation Witnesses somehow not important or at best second rate. But you are witnesses. You're always on call. Always witnessing. You with me? So God, God expects or God express his love and truth in the person of who? Jesus Christ. And God want to, God want to express himself through you. As a person, a unique person, through the gifts he has given you, you cannot do what I do, and I can't do what you do. I remember as the pastor of churches and the guy asked me one time, he said, Pastor, how do you feel that when, when you invite a guest speaker and you stand in next to the guest speaker and they shake your hand and the members say, oh, we wish our pastor could preach like that? <laughs> I said, I don't care. Somebody can always do something better than I can do. I can't preach like Carlton Bird. Or I can't preach like Henry Wright. But I can preach in my own armor. It's like David. When, 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 when he sent out and he, and he said, and he, he wanted to fight Goliath and, 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 and Saul was head and shoulder above everybody else. And, he, and David wanted to go and fight him. So, so King Saul said, hey, David, take my arm on. And David was like this. He says, I know you mean good. I know you mean me well, but I can't fight in your armor. 
I'm used to the slingshots. Uh, and I'm used to some stones and I can swing it like this. And so you must fight in your own armor. Uh, so don't compare yourself with anybody. You cannot do what so-and-so do. You can't tell the story like somebody tell the story. But you can be a witness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We need to get, we need to forget about this stuff. And stop comparing yourself with somebody else. You can't do it the way they do it. My wife can tell stories. That's how mama brought up telling stories. She's third generation of Venice. I'm just first generation. She knows the church in and out. But I don't, but I have to fight my own armor. You must fight in your own armor. Don't feel that in, 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 in theory because you can't do what somebody else do. Operate in your own armor and have confidence in your own armor. Have faith in your own armor. You, we all are called to be witnesses. Hallelujah. Yes. So, fight through the gift he has given you. And to put it in the vernacular, hustle. Nike said, just do it. Allow the Spirit to empower and use the gifts he has given you. You see, a witness is from the Greek word, which we get our English word, martyr. A witness is willing to make the supreme sacrifice, to be honored, to suffer for the Lord. You're talking about the crucible, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So witness is a martyr. A witness is willing to make the supreme sacrifice to be honored to suffer for the Lord. A witness tells of something they know by first-hand knowledge or personal experience. <laughs> Isn't that something? Yes, sir. They tell what great things the Lord has done for them. That which we have seen with our own eyes which our hands have handled of the word of life, which we have heard declare we unto you that, that ye also may have fellowship with, with him and that your joy may be full. You know, that's First John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. John is giving you what he has seen. He says, I've experienced this. I have, I have, I have touched him. I have handled him. I have seen him. And, 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 and we have our fellowship with him. And we want to share it with you, that you may have that joy. Do you have joy? You know, some Adventists are not ever happy. <laughs> you know, some people you, want, you don't want to be around. You know people like that? Here she come or here he come. You don't want to be around them because they're always damp and stuff. They're negative. You don't want to hear that stuff. When I played football, the guys came around talking about being cut. The guys said, I don't be around that because they're talking about being cut. And the next day it was cut, you know. Football is a business, you know. My room, it was cut off of the first practice. It ain't like the Adventist church. We put our buddies in position that can't do the job. <laughs> you are witnesses. Yeah. You are witnesses. Here's John's eyewitness testimony. In the book of Acts of the Apostle, page 555. It says, as a witness for Christ, John entered into no controversy, no worrisome contention. In other words, he's not arguing about his testimony. Like we like, you know, Adventists like to, you know, we like to volley and talk about stuff. You know, we like to talk about the Bible and talk about this is done that way. And one thing I hear all talking about teaching, we always teaching. I camp meeting every, when we have camp meeting regularly, they, they're always giving these Bible certificates out for Bible workers they have trained. And you can't find none. <laughs> we always training. Always training, training, training. And never working. We are the best for training. Always talking. Long on talk. But short on work. That's all we do. We sit and we absorb everything. We are, we, are, we are spiritually constipated. We need an enema to get that stuff out. We, we, we need to get back to players' ways. You know, 
In football, there's a fine you to come. They give you a weight. So we want you to come in at 200 pounds. If you're coming over, we got to fine you. It could be a hundred dollars a pound or whatever. But we're gonna find you. And so we need to get down to spiritual weight. And how do you get there? Run for Jesus. That's how you get there. So here's John. Okay, I got carried away. So John declared what he knew, what he had seen and heard. He had been intimately associated with Christ, had listened to his teaching, had witnessed his mighty miracles. Few could see the beauties of Christ's character as John saw them. For him, the darkness had passed away. On him, the true light was shining. His testimony regarded to the Savior's life and death was clear and forcible. John did not send up smoke singles. His testimony was clear. He didn't live one way in church and live one way at home on the job. His testimony was clear. That's what people want to see, that you believe in what you believe. But the Adventists don't believe in what we have. I'm meddling. First hand, that was John's testimony. In the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 6 and 7, turn there with me. Matthew, chapter 28. I'm going to point something out to you here. We are witnesses. Are you with me? Yes. Matthew 28, verses 6 and 7. Matthew 28, verses 6 and 7. The Bible tells us this. Matthew 28, verses 6 and 7. Now we know the women went to anoint Jesus' body with what? They went to uh, with Jesus with some spices prepared for his body, right? Yes. So the angel said this in Matthew 26. He said, he is not here. For he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. Isn't that something? Good news. We serve a risen Savior. Yes. So the angel of Christ told them not to be afraid. Uh huh. And the second, he says, come and see that Jesus was alive. Now, we often emphasize the third command, but the angel says, gave them, it says, go quickly and tell the disciples, right? We often miss before the angel told them to go and tell, he bid them come see. You see, you have nothing to tell unless you have seen it for yourselves. <laughs> right, right, right. You have nothing to tell unless you have seen it yourself. You have you, you, nothing to give unless you first receive it. Wow. Nothing to share unless you experience it. Wow. You are witnesses. That's it. That's it. Isaiah 43.10 says, You are my witnesses. You cannot be a witness in a court of law based on what someone else has seen. Am I right? You must see it for yourself. My wife likes to watch Judge Judy. I like to watch it too. And so, you watch it? You ever seen Judge Judy? You know, the people come and say, well, I, I heard and they told me. He said, I don't want to hear that. She said, zip it. And I don't care if you say it faster, I still want to hear it. And so it's the same thing as hair. You know, I don't want to hear what somebody told you. <laughs> you got to see for yourself. And maybe why the reason why we're not telling, maybe we ain't seen nothing. <laughs> you got to see before you can tell. You must hear it before you can tell it. Uh huh. And you must receive it before you can share it. You are witnesses. Isaiah saw the Lord, and it changed his life. He shared the story and worked powerfully as a witness for God. The two, the two, dynamics, the two dynamics saw Jesus, and they told the whole city. A woman out of well saw Jesus and told the whole town. 
Zacharias, or Zacchaeus saw Jesus and he called his friends and shared his experience. Paul on the road to Damascus saw Jesus and his ministry turned the world upside down. Oh, if only the seven Adventist church people will see Jesus. Have you seen him? We will turn the world upside down. We will turn Houston upside down. But you need to taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. You need to taste for yourself. Yeah. He's sweeter than honey out of the honeycomb. Yes, sir. Jesus says, I'm the alpha and the omega. The beginning and the end. And so what he's actually saying, everything you need between A to Z, I'm all of that in sound. Whatever you need. You know, we like get sucked into these things we see on TV with these guys with this prosperity ministry. Talking about planting seed. Let me tell you where your seed should be planted. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse. And an offering. And God says, see, if I will not open your windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, there shall be what? He says, prove me. But we don't have the guts to prove him. You sit there whining. After you do what God has asked you to do, Bring your tithe, bring your liberal offering, and be prudent. Don't go buy everything you see. And then when you're in the tight, someone called me the other day about that. You know, I said, he said, well, you know, I don't want to go to nobody else. I said, try God. I don't care if you don't have money to pay your rent. I don't care if you have money to pay that car note. I don't care if you have money to buy your medication, God says bring me a faithful tithe and a liberal offering and prove me and see if I will open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing and there shall not be room enough to receive it. And so after you have done what God asked you to do, you open that Bible to Malachi and put your hand on that promise and says, God you said to try you, I'm proving you I'm claiming the promise, now open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing and I guarantee you those blessings are coming. I'm going to open it. You don't need to open all the windows, just one. <laughs> My wife can't break down the other day at somebody's house. She's doing Bible study. Can I break down someplace else? That's a blessing. Could be on the side of the road somewhere. Ellen White said, God has a thousand ways of blessing you that you know nothing of. <laughs> just try it. Uh, So the essential preparation needed for a witnessing, needed for any witnessing, is to taste and experience God for ourselves. Mm. You with me? John says in 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked, looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Unless we experience, unless we experience this transforming grace in our own lives, we cannot tell with power and witness with success. You must experience it. There must be a change. God is calling us to spend time in his presence in order to have a first-hand experience of him. But you got to spend time. You must take time to spend time with God. Notice I said you must take time to spend time with God. The person of Christ, number three. We are witnesses to the power of the Holy Spirit, and we are witnesses to the person of Jesus Christ. A better translation is, you shall be my witnesses. The Greek of me, not to me. Not witnessing to the facts of life, but of your relationship with Jesus Christ. We are not in the world to bear witness to Christ. We are in, the, we are in Christ bearing witness to the world. You with me? Yeah. Knowing that he is able to keep that which we have committed unto him. We have peace that passes all understanding. And naturally we want to share the joy of the Lord. Amen. If you got it, you want to share it. Can't help yourself. 
Let the brother say, I, you know, I ain't no refrigerator. I can't hold nothing. <laughs> so you got to share it. You got to tell it. Isn't that right? We are witnesses. Yes, sir. We are witnessing. We are witnesses. So the joy is found in the word of God. You know, once upon a time, we used to be known of the people of the book. We don't even bring Bibles to church anymore. I know you got these phones and, and everything electronically, but, but when that Bible is, it's a testimony. When people see that Bible, they say, this person must be a, a Christian. But nobody knows who you are. You travel in Cornito. You, you're so cute, you don't want to even know you're a Christian. You are witnesses. And when you get that Bible, you are, you are, you are a witness. People right. say, that guy's going to church on the Sabbath. He's a seven-day Adventist. You don't know. Y'all dress all kind of how these days. <laughs> come, to school, come, to, come to church with these shoes on with no socks and blue jeans. Even preachers dressing like that. They must not read Spirit of Prophecy. Ellen White said we ought to dress a certain way. You know, in the Bahamas, we just call them holy gully. You, know. you can't come before God dress all kind of how. If you go into the White House, you won't dress like that. You, you saw when, when, the, when the prince got married, he sent out a dress code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't come up in here with no hoochie mama stuff. <laughs> it didn't, and everybody came dressed. Yeah. Right. No, no, no deep cut blouse, all that thing hanging out. Yeah. They came right. Yeah. And the people that wanted to come to the wedding, they dressed right. And we, and we have a dress code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a thing called moderation. Uh, I don't know, something like that. We, we, we're supposed to be a, a conservative church. <laughs> but we want to come into God's house any kind of way. When God was coming on to meet the people, he told Moses, tell the people to take a bath and get ready. Isn't that right? And he draw a line and said, don't you come by that? Otherwise, you'd be striking down. We big and bold. We come to the house of God any time out. But you go to the White House, you go to court, you even tell the criminals, cut your hair so they can look presentable before the judge. Isn't that right? You want to make a good impression. You are witnesses. <laughs> I said the joy is found in the word of God. The living word of a crucified, risen, ascended, and soon coming Lord. He's coming soon. There's a little story here. I'm not going to stay too long. A young soldier was utterly humiliated by a senior officer. The officer had gone beyond the bounds of acceptable behavior in disciplining the young soldier, and he knew it. So he said nothing as the younger man said through his clenched teeth. I will make you regret, I will make you regret this if it's the last thing I do. A few days later, as fate will have it, the company was under heavy gunfire. And the officer was wounded, cut off from his troops. And through the blaze of gun battle on the battlefield, he saw a figure coming to his rescue. It was the young soldier. Yes, sir. At the risk of his own life, the young soldier dragged the officer to safety. The officer said apologetically, Son, I owe you my life. The young man laughed and said, I told you that I would make you regret humiliating me if it was the last thing I ever did. Isn't that something? If it was you, you'd leave him out there. <laughs> That's God's revenge. That's God's revenge. Go and get him. Even though they talk about you, even though they humiliate you, even though they spit on you, even though they do all these things about you. But what we do, we leave the church. I'm here to tell you this is the safest place to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get stink sometimes, like the ark. You know, but 
God is here. You won't go out in the deep and, and be the bound of the shores and get, you know, God is here. You need to get the attitude, I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. I ain't going to let no pastor turn me around. I ain't going to let no elder turn me around. No Sabbath school superintendent. I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. I'm here for the long haul. I got my seat belt buckled. I believe this is the remnant. And ain't no other remnant. You know the remnant of remnant. These people come with all this stuff. I don't have time for that. Y'all, if y'all want to do that, do that. What I'm reading is not concerning that. I'm trying to make it in. And I ain't going to let nobody detour me with all this offshoot stuff. Talking about new light. Ain't no new light. <laughs> might, be new to, might be new to you because you just read it. <laughs> you know, I ain't going to let nobody get, and I'm not jumping in with you. You know, you're in the water, I'm not jumping in. I'm like on the plane that said, you know, put on your own oxygen first, I get mine on. Now, if you're in there, I'm going to take my belt off and say, you get it. Take my pants off and show it to you and pull you in if you hold on. But if you want to drown, you can drown by yourself. I'm not jumping in. <laughs> Do my best to save you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Behold the land that takes away the sins of the world. You see, something happened at Calvary. That bridge, the gap between a holy God and unholy humanity. We can see Christ in his majesty, but also in his mercy. You owe your life to Jesus, and it's quite a story to tell. You got a story. Tell the story, you see. Tell the people of the world. Tell your story. Jesus says, witness first in Jerusalem. To, be, to begin where you are, to the family and friends and those nearest and dearest to you, the Lord placed you there for a purpose. I'm the only seven that minister in my family. But God placed me there for a purpose. And when I go home to visit, I don't eat like they eat. And I don't go where they go. I don't drink what they drink. So they just look at me because I'm witnessing. They said, Hardy, I don't know what I'm going to cook for you. I said, just cook the peas and rice. Don't put no pork. Don't put no meat in it. And I'll eat that. And they said, you don't eat fish? I said, no. They said, boy, Miss Weaver brought you up on fish. What? <laughs> and so I'm saying, just live. And when you live, when they live, when you just live, they will ask you, why don't you eat catfish? Why don't you eat shrimp? Why don't you dip and why don't you dip and chew and smoke? Yeah. Why don't you drink caffeinated drinks? I know some of y'all drinking caffeine. What's that Coca-Cola and coffee? I don't care for Count Vacuum. I'm just preaching the gospel. <laughs> I'm old enough, I don't care. I just tell it straight. It might be tight, but it's right. You know, if it hits you, say, ow, you know. But, but, but live. <laughs> live. I'm living for Jesus. You got no heaven to put me in. You got no hell to put me in. I'm living for Jesus. Only Jesus died for me. So I still believe in the Advent message. I ain't trying to cool it off. I'm just trying to make it in. Do you want to make it in? So you need to live. You need to be a witness. If you're the only one in your family, God placed you there for a purpose. Tell them why you don't smoke. Tell them why you don't drink. When you live, they'll ask you questions. When I went to my college reunion from Cedar Boston State University, and, and they said, oh, which that's why you live, that's why you look the way you look, because you don't eat all that stuff. And so I was able to witness. I'm a witness. Uh, you don't need to say that and just live. When you live, God will open up doors for you. Then you can tell your story. It's a good story. Yeah. Yes, sir. Tell them they want the joy and the peace that you have. Amen. They want the peace that you have. All those athletes, all that money, they don't have the peace that you have. When Pharaoh, when, when Joseph, when Israel went down to Pharaoh, he blessed Pharaoh. You, wanna, you need to bless the Pharaohs of the world because you have that peace that they are trying to get. God has given it to you. 
I was listening to an interview with Smokey Robinson. You know who that is, right? All right, don't have that flashback. <laughs> but anyhow, he's doing an interview, and the guy asked him, say, uh, he said, Smokey, you a vegetarian, huh? He says, uh, he said, what that mean? He said, well, you know, he said, I just eat fowl and, and uh, fish. So he said, yeah, yeah, turkey and chicken, that's all he did. But he said, Barry Gordy introduced me to a plant-based diet. Smokey, Smokey's still cruising, ain't he? <laughs> yeah, you all know that song. <laughs> yeah, Smokey look good. He's on a plant-based diet. What you all don't want? Jesus said, you defile this body. It's his body. He wants to live in here. You can't live in here. You're all smoking him out and catfishing him out and <laughs> caffeining him out. Jesus, I can't take it. Body's mine. I want it purified. Yeah. The world wants what we have. We don't want what we have. We try to become like the world and we try to dumb it down and make, make, make room for the world. When Daniel was in Babylon, he ain't eat like everybody else. He didn't say, I'm in Babylon, be a Babylonian. He was in Babylon, but he was not a Babylonian. You're in the world, but you should not be a worldian. You should be a Seventh-day Adventist. You ought to live and eat like a Seventh-day Adventist. We have a 24-7 we have a message. When you go to the store to buy something, you need to ask the question, will this glorify God? When you go buy something to eat, Will this glorify God? Uh huh. When you go someplace, will this glorify God? That's why Paul said, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Yes, sir. You are witnesses. You need to do nothing. Just live. But you got to live so God can use you. Yes, sir. You say, witness in Jerusalem, right? That's whom? Now you can't witness the whom if you're talking like them and cussing like them. You got to be different. You have to take the high road. When they talk about you, you have to say you're a new creature in Christ. They're talking about the person they used to know. He's dead. You remember that thing with the Jamaican bobsled? And when they turn over, they say, You're dead? You know, man, I ain't dead. Some of y'all not dead. <laughs> but you need to die. You need to kill that old man. Bury him up. Chain him up. Because he's a bad dude. Okay, let me hurry up and get out of here. I'm almost done. So Jerusalem, that's at home. Judea, beside us. Samaria, beside us. The world waiting for us. And it's time for us to be serious about the privileged people who with the message of Elijah and John the Baptist are to prepare the way of the Lord. We need to be serious. If the work of God be done, it will be done by the power of God. And if you want to be part of this war, then you need to obey the Lord, study his word, pray earnestly for the spirit to come and love one another. It's time to give first attention to being a witness than to doing witnessing. That we be willing to sacrifice for his cause. It's time we sense the implications of the truth. That we are not to be in the world bearing witness of Christ, but Christ, but in Christ bearing witness to, to the world. That we are witnesses. We belong to him. We belong to Jesus. Amen. You belong to Jesus, not yourself. Mm -hmm. Jesus died for you. You were not bought with silver or gold. You're born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So Jesus bids us to shine. He wants us to shine clean and pure light. Like a little candle burning on the night. In this world of darkness, we must shine. You in your small corner and I in mine. Jesus bids us shine for him. Well, he sees and knows if our light is dim. 
He looks down from heaven and sees us shine. You, your small corner and I and mine. Shine, shine, shine. Sing that. Give me three. That's one. Amen. Let this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know it? Oh, yeah. Just play it. Yes. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine 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 the house Let it shine in my house I'm gonna let it shine let it shine in my house. I'm gonna let it shine. Let's take the neighborhood. Let it shine in the neighborhood. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let Satan. one of us a light. Amen. We are witnesses. Yes. Yes, we are. If you just live, mm. just live, and let that light shine, Amen. God will do something amazing through you. But we have to live. And live so that God can use us. If that's your desire, why don't you stand with me? I want to be a light. I want to shine first in my own home. So I will draw others by the light I'm living. You see, a light doesn't say, look at me, I'm shining. It just shines. A light gives us warmth and direction. We need to be like John the Baptist. He's the greater light. I'm the lesser. And when we do what God has called us to do, we'll be a force to be reckoned with. You know, in the old days, then people used to bring people to the meetings. Today, just like Adventists who have any friends. Come to the meeting by yourself. You need to build some relationships. You can't go to heaven by yourself. Build some relationships. You have friends. You have relatives that don't believe what you believe and they don't know what you know. And Ellen White says they're going to say to us, and the kid, they're going to say to us, you notice what happened. And why did you make me understand? I don't want the blood of anybody on my head. So I'm, in, I'm imploring you to live. Live in such a way that God can use you. Let us pray, Heavenly Father. Oh God, you have called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. Oh God, 
Cause us, help us to live in such a way that you can use us. Cause us, Lord, to be witnesses for you. Oh, God, cause us to tell the story. It's a beautiful story. Lord, cause us to spend time with you that we may have that first-hand experience. That we can taste and see that God is good. Lord, cause us to share it with others. Save us from ourselves. Oh, God, we rededicate, we recommit ourselves to you, that we are witnesses for you. Bless us to this end. In the worthy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. All of God's people said, amen. Amen.